We are here tonight to study from the book of Acts, so I hope you can join me in the book of Acts chapter 22. We'll be looking at the last half of Acts 22 tonight, so I think we're starting with Acts 22 verse 17. So I hope you can join me there in just a few moments, but have that ready and we'll be able to get to that right away. I hope to see you in worship this coming Sunday at either 9 or 11. I hope you can also be present for the class at 10 in between those two services as we continue looking at the exploits of King David. And for our members, please remember to use the Sign Up Genius account if you can to sign up for one of the two worship services. And remember, guests are always welcome. You do not need to sign up if you're visiting with us. And so if you're joining us tonight online and you are not a member of the congregation, if that Sign Up Genius does not work for you, just uh, come on and we'd love to see you this coming Sunday, either at 9 or 11. And then also for the Bible class in between at 10. Tonight we are continuing with our study of the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, or more, accu more accurately, as we've sometimes summarized it, some of the Acts of some of the Apostles, because it very narrowly focuses on just a few incidents from the life of Peter and some of his preaching and being put in jail and released and so on, and then the last roughly two-thirds of the book focus in on the conversion of Saul of Tarsus and his preaching as Paul the Apostle, and that finishes out the rest of the book. So the book was written by Luke who is referred to by Paul in the book of Colossians a little bit later as the beloved physician. And so he is a medical doctor of some kind, and he writes this book to a man by the name of Theophilus, giving him a history of the church, either just bringing him up to speed, giving him some sense of history so he fits into it, or maybe trying to convert this man. And another possibility, as we discussed a few months ago as we started this, was that Theophilus was some kind of government official. It is addressed to most excellent Theophilus, and that was a common way of referring to government officials. So there's a chance that Theophilus is serving in government somewhere, and certainly the book of Acts would give him some uh, sense of relief that the church was not out to overthrow the government, but they were working with the government, and certainly were very respectful and working under the Roman system. By way of very brief review, in the ABCs of Acts, we're using this as something of a memory tool, and so we have a successive letter of the alphabet for each chapter to help us remember what's in there. And so if you can remember that T is the 20th letter of the alphabet, then you know that chapter 20 deals with Troas on the Lord's Day. So we've been going through these uh, up to this point. We've looked at the ascension, beginning of the church, carried and cured, determined disciples, empty jail, first deacons, but always with the question mark since they aren't directly called deacons, a great hero, how can I, I am Jesus, journey to Joppa, kingdom includes Gentiles, liberated again, missionaries sent out, not gods but men, old law not binding, Philippian jailer converted, questions answered in Athens, reasoning with a preacher, saving our religious friends, Troas on the Lord's Day, uproar in Jerusalem. And so we continue tonight in chapter 22, which is summarized with the words valuable citizenship. So valuable citizenship. We're already down to the letter V, which is amazing. So chapter 22. So just to bring us up to speed here, in the middle of chapter 21, you may remember Paul comes back from his third missionary journey. He is seen in Jerusalem with a Gentile, which is not surprising. He's been preaching to Gentiles for the past five years all around the Mediterranean world. But his enemies see him with this man, and they make up the story that Paul has actually brought multiple Gentiles into the temple itself, which was against the law. And they instigate a riot over this. And when people get together in large groups like that, when they're angry, they don't often think straight. Things don't go well. Uh, they're about to murder Paul on the spot right there in the middle of the temple courtyard. This is the paved area in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, if you can see it there. But the Roman commander, he hears this commotion. He floods this area with soldiers, and they drag Paul up the stairs toward the fortress, which is in the middle of the image. This is something of a scale model. Um, but these four towers were the four corners of the barracks, something of a headquarters for the Roman army in Jerusalem. And King Herod had that attached to the temple for situations exactly like this. He knew that uh, they were prone to be a little bit disorderly there in Jerusalem. And so he planned ahead and thankfully he did. On the stairs, as the soldiers are dragging him out, I kind of, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, almost mosh pit style, he kind of crowd surfing pulling him out, barely escaping with his life. But on the stairs, uh, Paul asks the commander, the Roman commander, for permission to address the crowd. 
And I think most of us, if we were in charge of a situation like this, we would say, under no circumstances whatsoever. And yet, Paul establishes a rapport with this man. Permission is granted to address the crowd. And this speech begins in Acts chapter 22. We looked at the first 16 verses of that speech last week, and we noted that he switches from speaking Greek to the commander to speaking in the Hebrew dialect to the mob gathered down below. And so he addresses them in their own language. He is extremely respectful. I think many of us in a situation like this may just go off on them. How dare you do this and, and that kind of thing. But he is extremely respectful under the circumstances, addressing them as brethren and fathers. So amazing that he has the uh, self-restraint to do that. But brethren and fathers, he gives his own personal history as a faithful Jew. He's a zealous defender of the faith, just like they are. He was a persecutor of the way. So the church is known as the way. And then he tells the story of his conversion, starting with seeing Jesus on the road to Damascus, and then the conversation with Ananias three days later, and then the question and the command in Acts twenty two sixteen, where Ananias says, Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So amazing. Uh, just the brief summary of God's plan of salvation right there. And this is where we left it last week. We took a break right in the middle of Paul's defense or his speech on the stairs there. So let's pick up tonight with Acts 22, verses 17 through 21. Acts chapter 22, verses 17 through 21, as Paul continues speaking to this mob on the stairs in between the temple courtyard and the fortress. It happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance and I saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I also was standing by approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Well, Paul is still explaining his conversion to this mob in the temple. And what I think we've overlooked in this passage before, at least I've overlooked this before, is that in verse 17, Paul is talking about something that happened right there in the place where he is now standing. And so, again, like the beginning of this speech, he is communicating the idea, I am one of you, so I am just like you are. So while I was praying in the temple, while I was doing what you came here to do today, a number of years ago, the Lord appeared to me right here again, just like he did on the road to Damascus. Only now, he appeared to me in the temple itself. So we have Jesus appearing to Paul or Saul at that time on the road to Damascus, and now we have Paul's record of Jesus appearing to him in the temple where all these people are now assembled, which I would think would have perhaps some impact on them. The Lord's message on this occasion was basically, get out. You need to get out of here. It's not safe. And the reason is the people of Jerusalem will not accept your message. And to me, it seems as if Paul is agreeing with the Lord here. Uh, Paul doesn't say, no, I'm okay. I'll be safe here. No, Paul can see this. And so he summarizes some of what he used to do, chasing people down, imprisoning believers, uh, even standing by and approving the murder of Stephen. So he knows uh, what this crowd is capable of doing. And the Lord's conclusion on that occasion is, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Uh, we'll see in the next paragraph, this doesn't go over too well, the reference to the Gentiles. When the Jewish people reject the Messiah, uh, he will turn his kingdom over to the Gentiles. And that is a common theme throughout the New Testament. We see it in the parable of the landowner over in Matthew chapter 21. You may remember the landowner planted the vineyard and then rented it out. But when harvest time came, the renters wouldn't pay up. And so the owner sends a, a series of servants, those who were beat up and killed by the renters, and then he sends his only son, thinking, well, surely they'll listen to him. But of course, if you remember that parable back in Matthew 21, they kill the son as well. And Jesus then asked the religious leaders, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? And they answer back in Matthew 21, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end, and will rent out the vineyard to the other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. 
Well, Jesus quotes from the psalm about the stone that the builder rejected becoming the chief cornerstone, and he applies it. And the chief priest and the Pharisees understood very clearly that Jesus was talking about them. They tried to kill Jesus right then, but they didn't because they were afraid of the crowds. Well, my point in bringing this up tonight is to remind us that the people trying to kill Jesus are the same men trying to kill Paul here in the same uh, place, in the same uh, uh, attitude, I think we might say. And so again, this is maybe 20 years later, so maybe not the exact same men, but maybe their sons, or maybe they were related, or maybe there were some of the same men still here. But the situation is the same. And we'll see this in the next several verses. So let's continue tonight with Acts 22, verses 22 through 24. Acts 22, 22 through 24. They listened to him up to this statement, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging so that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. So, Paul, uh, once he mentions the Gentiles, uh, the, the mob stops listening. I think we noticed that. We kind of took a little paragraph break in between there. But uh, going to the Gentiles, boom, that's the end of anything that Paul can really communicate uh, on this occasion. So that's it. No more. And it's kind of similar to Paul preaching on the Areopagus. Once he mentioned the resurrection, remember, that was the point where they said, nope, that's it. We're out of here on this. But anyway, here he mentions the Gentiles and that's the limit for them. So away with such a fellow from the earth, he shouldn't be allowed to live. And not only are they yelling this, but they are acting it out, aren't they? So it's not just, they're not just reciting something, uh, but they're actually getting violent. They're throwing off their cloaks. They're tossing dust into the air. Uh, I'm assuming they're taking off their coats to get ready for a fight. I think today we might, you know, refer to rolling up their sleeves or even in a fight, taking off your jacket and, and getting ready to get into it. And again, we think back to Paul holding the coats of those who were stoning and murdering Stephen. Um, they had to take their coats off before they could properly kill a man. Can't get your nice religious coat dirty and bloody by killing one of God's messengers. And so they were taking their coats off to get that done. And Paul was the coat keeper, the holder of the coats back then. And now, of course, the tables have turned. And Paul is on the receiving end of this. He's not delivering the persecution but he's in the process of getting persecuted. At this moment, as the crowd goes wild, the commander has Paul brought into the barracks and orders that he be examined by scourging. So he doesn't order a trial to figure out whether he needs to be scourged, but this is the trial. The scourging is the trial. So he orders that Paul be tortured so that he gives up the real reason why these people are so mad. In the commander's mind, something is missing here. Certainly these people wouldn't be so upset just because this guy mentioned Gentiles. So there's got to be something else going on. Uh, well, the commander, though, obviously um, doesn't really understand the Jewish people, does he? And um, to them, Paul is not only a traitor to his people, but he's a traitor to God himself. That's the way they're looking at Paul at this point. And so the commander then orders Paul to be examined by scourging. And uh, today, I, we would refer to somebody being tortured or waterboarded or whatever. We're going to torture this person to find out what they really know. Uh, the scourging, of course, was done to Jesus. Uh, scourge was something of a whip, uh, often made with multiple leather strands, sometimes embedded with little bits of iron or bone or glass. And some people didn't survive a scourging. It was so incredibly violent uh, it would actually stop the body from functioning. It was so violent. Bones could be broken in a scourging. Certainly blood loss would be a concern and so on. Well, the Jews had a limit of 40 lashes. That was their tradition. The Romans had no such limit. Their goal was to bring the person right to the point of death without actually crossing that line. So this is what is in store for Paul. And Paul is a Roman citizen, certainly uh, knows what this is. He is familiar with the process of scourging, and so he very easily could have objected at this point, but he doesn't. So let's continue then with Acts 22, verses 25 through 29. The next paragraph here, Acts 22, 25 through 29. 
But when they stretched him out with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman. The commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, Yes. The commander answered, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul said, But I was actually born a citizen. Therefore, those who were about to examine him immediately let go of him. And the commander also was afraid when he found out that he was a Roman and because he had put him in chains. One thing that amazes me in this passage is Paul's incredible level of self-control. And I just briefly alluded to that earlier, but instead of warning the commander up front, as soon as he said scourging, Paul could have said, nope, can't do that to me, I'm a Roman. Instead of doing that, notice how Paul waits. He could have spoken up, but he doesn't. He waits. He waits until after they had stretched him out with the leather strap. So they bring him to the place of scourging. And I'm imagining there's blood on the floor from the last guy who got it there. And so they stretch him out, tie him down. Uh, me, I, I think I would flash my citizenship card before it ever got to that point. But Paul waits until the last possible moment. And I think looking back on this with 2020 hindsight, he does that for a reason, doesn't he? He does that for maximum effect. So as he is stretched out, as he is ready to be scourged, in my mind, in my, it doesn't say it here, in my mind, I envision this, the, the, the Roman has the, the scourge pulled back, you know, right there, right at the last possible moment. Only then does he ask the centurion. In my, in my mind, it's, a, oh, by the way, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Uh, years ago, I remember reading something about lawyers. And the advice in the column was for lawyers, never ask a question in open court that you don't already know the answer to. And I appreciate that. I don't remember where I read that, but never ask a question in court that you don't already know the answer to. And to me, that was interesting. And that seems to be what Paul does here. He's not asking, is he? He's not asking for his own benefit. He's not asking for the benefit of the soldier. You know, go look up the statute or that, you know, not that's not what's going on here. I mean, technically, he is asking a question. It is in the form of a question, but it's really more of a statement. He's informing the centurion that he is a Roman. How dare you torture a Roman citizen without a trial? This is not done. And Paul then, by waiting, he is, I think we might say, milking this for all it's worth. He's taking full advantage of his citizenship. In verse 26, as soon as the centurion hears that Paul is a Roman citizen, the centurion gets the commander and actually questions his commanding officer. Uh, what are you about to do? For this man is a Roman. So the commander then has, has given the centurion an illegal order. He's told him to do something that is a serious violation of Roman law. So something broke down here. So what are you about to do? At this point, the commander comes back himself. This is not something he deals with through his subordinates, but the commander comes in personally and, and questions Paul directly. Tell me, are you a Roman? And they go back and forth just a little bit there with the commander seemingly bragging about purchasing his citizenship with a large sum of money. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, I bought mine and I spent all these, you know, this amount of money on it. And at that point, Paul lets the commander know, I didn't buy my citizenship like you did. I was born a Roman. And so Paul then has the most valuable citizenship. That's the summary of this chapter, valuable citizenship. In verse 29, Paul is allowed to get up and the commander is actually afraid at what he's done. Uh, not only to how close he got to scourging a Roman citizen without a trial, but also for the fact that they had put Paul in chains. And oftentimes in the ancient Roman Empire, um, if you were guilty of doing this to somebody illegally, that would be done to you. And so the commander was almost guilty of being scourged himself, or at least worthy of having that done to him himself if, if this had continued. Um, he had imprisoned a Roman without going through the proper channels. And that, that is a serious violation of Roman law. That citizenship was extremely important. And to me, this seems very close, very similar to what Paul did back in Philippi. 
on his second missionary journey following the beating and imprisonment and the earthquake and all of that in Philippi. But back in Acts 16, Luke says this. This is what he writes in Acts 16, 35 through 40. And I just want to read this from Acts 16, what we studied a few weeks ago, to compare it to how Paul uses his citizenship here. This is Acts 16, 35 through 40. Now, when day came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen, saying, Release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrates have sent me to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. I kind of leave quietly by the back door. I'm kind of inserting that in my own paraphrase here. Just kind of just go, go quietly out the back door and just leave us alone. Picking up with Acts 16. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans? And have thrown us into prison, and now they are sending us away secretly? No, indeed. But let them come themselves and bring us out. The policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans, and they came and appealed to them. And when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So Paul, I just read that by way of reminder, that Paul used his citizenship to its maximum effect back in Philippi. He could have pulled that citizenship card out when they first started to beat him the previous day in Philippi. He could have avoided prison. He could have avoided being put in the stocks at night. But he went all through all that voluntarily to use that for the benefit of the Lord and his church. And he seems to be doing the same thing here in Acts 22. His citizenship is valuable, not just personally. This isn't just so he can avoid a beating or a night in jail or whatever. But his citizenship is valuable to the kingdom of God. And I think we can say the same thing today. We have some rights as American citizens that others in this world do not have. Uh, our nation certainly isn't perfect by any means. We have had some issues going back to the very beginning. And yet we are tremendously blessed as American citizens. This is still a place, a nation, where people want to come. Uh, we have the right to choose our own public officials. What an amazing blessing that is right there. Not all people enjoy that privilege. Uh, we have the right to peaceably assemble, guaranteed to us by our Constitution. We have the right to worship as we please, don't we? We have all kinds of rights. But let's make sure we use our rights, not just for our own personal benefit, but that we use our rights for the benefit of the Lord and his church. I think back to those days when we worshiped in a public school and we were threatened with a lawsuit by the atheist organization based here in Madison. We didn't allow ourselves to be bullied. We weren't mad about it. We didn't retaliate. We didn't go to the media, that kind of thing. But we were really thankful at the time for our freedom and for our courts and for the fact that the school district of Madison stood up for us. And they called me and the school district said, uh, we're with you. The United States Supreme Court is with you. We told those people to pound sand, but we just want you to be aware of what's going on here. And that's, I think, is an example of us using our rights as citizens not just for our own personal benefit, but for the benefit of the Lord and his church. Thankfully, we didn't have to go run and hide because of that, did we? But because of our citizenship, we were protected. Because of the religious freedom that we have in this country, we are able to use the postal system right now uh, to preach the gospel in prisons, aren't we? That's an amazing thing. Um, I don't know how many last month, 11 or 1,200 uh, courses sent out and graded just in the last month, 1,500 a couple months before that. And the fact that we can do this in prison with people who have had some of their rights restricted, we're still able to reach out in that way. It's just an absolute amazing blessing that we need to be thankful for with tomorrow being Thanksgiving. Let's be thankful uh, for our valuable citizenship. I would also remind us while we're on this of some policies of our local public schools. And I know sometimes our kids in the public schools will face pressure, intense pressure, uh, to miss school or uh, to miss worship for, for various school activities. And that's been a concern for 20, 30 years that I've been aware, at going back to even before that when I was a student in the public schools in the Chicagoland area. Uh, I'm thinking of kids being pressured. Um, you will attend this chorus concert at 7 p.m. on a Wednesday evening or you will fail this class. Uh, it is an integral part of your grade. You cannot miss for any reason. If you're not there at 7 o'clock Wednesday, I will fail you in this class. Our kids have heard that. Well, that 
kind of presented a problem in our family, didn't it? Because uh, we tend to have the same attitude toward worship that some teachers have toward that 7 p.m. Wednesday choral concert. Uh, thankfully, though, the district uh, had a policy at that time. I hope that they still do today. I didn't look this up again. But a policy uh, protecting religious freedom where they can't do that. They can't fail a child for missing a school activity uh, for a religious reason. I mean, first of all, I guess, obviously, I would rather my kids fail a music class than fail church. That's kind of obvious. There are things in this life that are more important than other things, and worship is one of those things. Uh, but thankfully, we never really needed to choose. Although it was portrayed as a choice that you need to make, this is not a choice that we needed to make. Uh, some teachers make it seem that way. The pressure was there. Uh, but here is the policy from the Madison Metropolitan School District Handbook at that time. I just printed it off at that time, put it in my folder, actually, on Acts 22 because of our valuable citizenship. But this is what it says. The district shall provide for the reasonable accommodation of a pupil's sincerely held religious beliefs with regard to all examinations and other academic requirements. Upon determining that there is a need for an accommodation under this policy, the pupil's school will provide a reasonable means by which a pupil exercising his or her sincerely held religious beliefs will be permitted to make up an examination or other academic requirement at another time or by an alternative means without prejudicial effect. Under no circumstances shall a teacher deduct points or lower a grade on a test, assignment, or other class requirement merely because a student has requested and received an accommodation pursuant to this policy. Isn't that amazing? So a teacher comes in and says, you will miss church or I will fail you in my class. That's the point where we turn to the student handbook and we can remind them very calmly and very diplomatically of this policy. And we used this several times, as I remembered. Our kids basically communicated to the teacher, um, I can't make it to whatever event due to a church activity. Therefore, I will attend another concert at a different school on a different night, and I'll write a report on it, or any number of things like that. There are other ways that we can respectfully uh, handle a situation like that, and they did. Uh, one time we went to one of Jordan's concerts, and uh, our kids wrote it up, and, and I think in that situation used their citizenship in this country and the freedom we have uh, to their advantage and to the Lord's advantage, just as Paul did here. And so let's just take this passage as a reminder that we should also be thankful today for our valuable citizenship. Well, let's conclude tonight with Acts chapter 22, verse 30. Acts 22, verse 30. But on the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priest and all the council to assemble and brought Paul down and set him before them. And I realize we've kind of removed this verse from its context just a little bit, but this is the commander trying to figure this thing out. So we have a lot of he's and him's back and forth here, but this is the commander trying to figure out what in the world do I, is this guy accused of. Um, so he needs to know what charges is he facing? Why is he in trouble with the Jews? And really, this will be a challenge over the next several chapters. We're going to see this come back over and over again the next several chapters here. What are the charges? Uh, Paul really has done nothing wrong. Right now, he's in custody for his own safety so that he doesn't get torn limb from limb. Um, so again, it seems as if they're so mad, he must be guilty of something. So their anger seems to indicate that Paul must be a really, really, really bad man. Uh, but nobody seems to be able to find an actual law that Paul has broken. So he's in custody for his own protection. Well, the commander then releases Paul, arranges a more orderly gathering where Paul can face the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin, so they can try to bring some formal charges and figure this thing out. And this is where we leave it tonight. Next week, hopefully, we'll get to Paul making his defense before the Jewish council. But tonight we've studied Paul and his valuable citizenship, and we've worked our way through the end of Acts chapter 22, and we've been reminded that we also have valuable citizenship, and we're very thankful to be uh, citizens of this nation. Uh, thank you for taking the time to study together with us tonight. I hope you can join us on worship on Sunday. Uh, join us for worship on Sunday at 9 or 11, and plan on joining us for the class in between at 10, The Exploits of King David. 
uh, sign up on Sign Up Genius now if you can, and let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about. But uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are Almighty God, King of kings, and Lord of all lords. Tonight we are especially thankful to you for our citizenship in this great nation. We know that we have rights that others around the world do not seem to have, at least they're not recognized. We pray that we would always recognize that these rights come not from government, but from you, from your hand. We ask, therefore, that we would always use our citizenship here for the benefit of you and of your kingdom, the church, never using our freedom for evil, but always for good. Thank you, Father, for your book. Thank you for Luke, and thank you for Luke's record of the growth of the early church. Be with those who are traveling this week. Be with those who are uh, able to get together with family. We pray that we would always recognize that every blessing in this life comes down to us from your hand. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior. Amen.